to catch me coughing on camera. Okay, <laughs> so welcome everyone. Uh, so we're having guests today. So we have a very packed schedule. So Kurt is going to start with the first talk on Reese representation theory or theorem. Should be. Right. Let me share screens. Let me get my slides. All right, you can see everything? Yep. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a generalization of the Rees representation theorem. That's, in, in finite dimensions, that boils down to the statement that row vectors and column vectors are the same thing, but more generally, it's a statement about linear functionals on a vector space and the various ways that we can think about those linear functionals. So in finite dimensions, it's a nice natural isomorphism. And you can think about that in terms of Hilbert spaces, or you can think about that in terms of matrices. Um, and it's really nice in the finite dimensional case. But if you want to generalize that statement to an infinite dimensional vector space, you run into the problem where we don't have a lot of these tools that we take advantage of in the finite dimensional case. We don't automatically have an inner product. We don't have uh, matrices and uh, coordinates that we can just write down in finite time, everything about our vectors and linear functionals. So we need more sophisticated tools to deal with our vector spaces. And so this version of the theorem is how we can do that when we're living in a special kind of topological space. So specifically in this talk, I'm gonna be walking through the proof and setup behind this theorem. I don't think that um, I necessarily have time to go through the proof, it's quite lengthy, but I definitely have time to give you guys a sense of what's going on and how do you build up to the definition so first we need to define the kinds of topological spaces that we're interested in. So we say that a topological space is locally compact if for every point in the space, there is some compact set containing the point with a non-empty interior. So a more like technical way to phrase that would be saying that you have an open set inside of your compact set and that open set also contains your point. So this is important because if I just told you that, well, you can take the singleton set or some finite set that contains your point, that's not a very interesting case. We want compact sets, which are non-trivial in some sense. And if you can do this, we call that local compactness. Similarly, um, we say that X is a Hausdorff space. If for any two pair of points in your space that you give me, I can surround them with disjoint open sets, um, almost like separating these two guys with bubbles. So give me one point, you give me another point. I can draw some open sets around them that will keep them apart. So if you have both local compactness and the Hausdorff property, we say that the space is a locally compact Hausdorff space or an LCH space. So these are particularly good topological spaces. They let us avoid a lot of the uh, kinds of pathologies that we have in very general topological spaces. And they also happen to be just nice enough to give us uh, another form of the Rees representation theorem. So some more notation that goes along with this discussion. We say that F is subordinate to an open set U denoted by this kind of like cuspy less than or equal to less than sign. If the function takes values between zero and one, and if it's support, the set of points that it's non-zero at is contained within the open set. That's a, a similar condition to saying that this thing is less than or equal to the indicator function for that set, but it is, it's a little bit stronger than that, um, as we'll see in a second. 
So we also have a dual notion, which is that a compact set can be subordinate to F. And we have a similar condition that F needs to take uh, values in between zero and one. And if you evaluate F at any point in your compact set, you're gonna get one out again. So um, in particular, we can consider this for general functions, but we're only gonna be interested in this conversation with the special class of functions. So for any topological space you give me and any set A, we're gonna let C sub C of A denote the set of continuous functions from X into R that are compactly supported in A, meaning that their support lives inside of A. So for these two notions, um, there's a nice picture that we can draw. And it's depicted in the Urysen lemma. So what happens is that if F is subordinate to an open set, that's this yellow set in the picture, it means that F is zero everywhere outside of that open set. Zero out here, it's zero out here. And inside of the open set, it can do something interesting. Now, saying that the compact set K is subordinate to F means that everywhere inside of K, the function is identically one. And so the Urysen lemma says that if you give me any pair of sets, one compact, one open, and you let the compact set sit inside of the open set, the Urysen lemma says that I can find a function F which will sandwich in between the two of them. And so this is a very important statement for proving our version of the Ries representation theorem. Now, I mentioned a second ago that saying that F is subordinate to U is a bit stronger than um, saying it's uh, less than or equal to the indicator function. And what I mean by that is that this function F actually needs to become identically zero somewhere inside of the function. So the support is also contained strictly inside of U. Um, and that there's a non-zero distance between the boundary of the support and the edge of the open set. So that's what the Urysen lemma gives us on any LCH space. So now we also need to define what a partition of unity is, um, which is more specifically a part of the proof, but um, it's not such a complicated notion. So a partition of unity is just a set K such that um, if you give me some collection of open sets which cover K, then for each open set VI, there is an HI subordinate to it. And at any point that you look at, the HI is all sum to be one. So in particular, this condition means that um, anywhere you look, at least one of the HIs is non-zero. And if you start adding them up, you always have unity. Um, implicit in here with the subordinate condition, they need to be like positive functions. So really these H functions are giving you different fractions that add up to one. And so there's a nice picture that we can draw for this. This is a partition of unity on the unit circle. So if you imagine taking the interval from zero to two pi, you can take this interval, you can wrap it around and make a circle, right? So these are um, continuous functions on the circle. They're compactly supported because the circle is a compact set. And this is a partition of unity because at any point that you look at, some number of the functions are non-zero. And if you add these guys up, you get one. So at the um, place I'm looking at, it's maybe like one half and then uh, like three tenths or something and two tenths, like 
they, there are some fractions that will add up to one. And um, based off of the definition that we gave, all of these functions are compactly supported, meaning that they each have their own compact sets, which contain them. But in this case, it's not such an interesting statement because we're working on the circle, so everything's compact. So now, another final piece of um, terminology is that of a Radon measure. So we say that a uh, Borel measure is a regular measure if it has these two properties. But before I talk about that, let me just define what a Borel measure is. So the topology on a, on a topological space is the collection of all open sets. Every open set is, of course, a subset of your space. So it follows that the topology is uh, some subset of the power set on your space. And in particular, um, if we think about measures, well, we know that measures are things that take measurable sets and map them to real numbers. Uh, this is what the measure mu does, right? So a, we say that a, um, a measure is Borel if the domain of the measure, this sigma algebra M, contains the open sets. And in particular, it needs to also contain closed sets because like it satisfies some axioms that make it a uh, sigma algebra, but the kind of like takeaway flashcard version is just that, oh, the topology um, is contained inside the uh, measure. It's contained inside the domain of the measure. I can always measure open sets. So if you can measure open sets, we call it Borel. We call the measure regular if for any measurable set that you give me, I can approximate it from the outside using open sets. So you give me a set E, I can take open sets that live outside of E and I can shrink them until I get just E. And outer regularity says that you're always gonna get the right number out of this. Inner regularity is um, a complementary statement which just says that if I take compact, compact sets inside of E, then the biggest thing you can get out is the measure of E itself. So you can approximate from the outside, you can approximate from the inside. This is a useful technical tool and we call that regularity. So uh, it turns out that on a general topological space um, or a general measure space, I guess, Requiring regularity for all sets is a little bit of a strict property. So a more uh, relaxed notion is just to say that it's regular on enough sets that we get good properties. And if it is, we call it a Radon measure. In particular, we need outer regularity everywhere, but we only need inner regularity on open sets. And as a final requirement, we need that any compact set you give me needs to have finite measure. I can't be working with the real numbers, but also have that um, the unit square is of infinite mass. My, my compact sets all need to be finite in nature. So this is a good notion of a measure and we call that a Radon measure. So finally, we're in the position to state the Ries Markov Kapitani theorem aka the Ries representation theorem on locally compact Hausdorff spaces. So take my topological space X and let lambda be a positive linear functional. Positive just means that if I give you a positive function, then lambda of F is also a positive number or non-negative. So, If you give me this lambda, this positive linear functional, then there exists a 
sigma algebra M such that it is uh, it contains the Borel sigma algebra, meaning it contains the topology and also contains everything that you generate with the with the topology, all unions and intersections and uh, complements that you would need for a sigma algebra. That's B of X. The statement says that B of X is in your sigma algebra. And the statement is that there is a unique positive measure on that sigma algebra, which represents the linear functional in the sense that applying the linear functional to a function is the same thing as integrating with respect to that measure. Really, this is defining like uh, an isomorphism isomorphism of vector spaces, but right now we're only thinking about positive linear functionals. So as you might imagine, there is a more general statement that you can make, um, but that one you need to be a little bit more careful about. So if you restrict your attention to linear functionals that are positive, then you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between positive linear functionals and positive measures, meaning sets only have positive mass. Now, this is all well and good, but the theorem actually gives us more. It tells us that mu is a complete Radon measure. So it's Radon in the sense that it's a good measure, it's compatible with the topology, um, it lends itself well to approximation arguments, and it's complete, which just means it's a, uh, it, it's a technical condition that says that the sigma algebra is also pretty nice. So it would take a little while for me to develop why these properties are really useful to have, but the ries markov kakutani theorem gives us a lot of neat properties. So um, the proof of this theorem is a bit hairy, but what I wanna do for you uh, with the remaining time is just to tell you how you construct this thing. So, to construct the sigma algebra, we first need to um, think about the measure. So we're going to define the measure on open sets by saying that let f be let, let the measure of any open set be the supremum of the linear functional acting on any functions uh, that is subordinate to the open set. So this is some collection of functions. And if you take the supremum of it, the supremum exists. It's going to be a finite number, or in certain cases, it'll be a finite number, but I guess not generally. Um, but the fact of the matter is that this thing is a, uh, a good like pre-measure. So right now, it's just a set function on the topology. Um, we also get monotonicity immediately from this definition, because any function that is subordinate to an open set U is immediately subordinate to any open set that contains it. It's uh, like the subordinate property carries over. So suddenly you also have subordinate to this guy. So the second step that you would need to do is that you need to define what's called an outer measure, which means that if you give me any set, then I'm going to define the outer measure of that set by being the best approximation of that set that I can get from the outside. So you look at open sets that contain your set, the infimum of all those open sets, um, the infimum of their measures is going to be the measure of your set E or the outer measure of E. So number three, we take this outer measure and we define an outer algebra. I don't know what you call this. It's a collection of sets to be the set of all um, sets E such that you also can approximate it from the inside with compact sets and that the measure of E is finite. So you take all these sets, you put them into a, uh, a collection of sets. And finally, you define the sigma algebra just to be the set of any sets that if you intersect with a compact set, you get back to here. Meaning if you intersect with a compact set, 
Now you have something of finite measure and you have something which can be approximated by compact sets. This is the domain of our um, Ries representation measure. And the way that we define the measure mu is just to say that it is the outer measure restricted to the set. And so that is the construction behind the Ries representation theorem. If you want to prove it, I have an 11 step process, but I don't have time to go over that. All right. Thank you, Kurt. Now we have some time for questions or any questions. Maybe I have a question. Did you like think about the question? Well, actually, let's let's go on to uh, Yan Bing's talk. So now Yan Bing is going to speak about exponential topology. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. So. Uh, so everyone's slides from yesterday are really fancy, but uh, I'm pretty basic. So let's go with Beamer. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, exponential topology, which is a topology that we equipped on a set of uh, continuous functions between two topological spaces. And uh, how uh, we know that if such a uh, topology exists, uh, which has a certain property, then this topology is unique. And this is a topic that uh, I have learned this semester in my topology class. So first, a uh, quick recap. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone here knows uh, what is a topology, both as an area of mathematics and uh, as a technical term uh, defined or equipped on sets. So essentially topology is a sub area of mass that we study the properties that's uh, on a geometric object that are preserved and their continuous deformation, including say stretching, twisting, bending, but not uh, tearing uh, or breaking up and gluing them back together. And suppose we have a set capital X and we let tau of X denote a collection of subsets of X, then we would say that tau of X is a topology on X if uh, it satisfy these three properties. First, uh, both the empty set and X are elements of a tau of X. And second and third is that the union of arbitrary many elements of tau of x, as well as the intersection of finitely many elements of tau of x are also uh, elements of tau of x. And we call the elements in tau of x to be the open sets and the pair x tau of x is called a topological space. And a lot of times we wrote uh, x uh, in lieu of x tau x if the topology we equipped on x are explicitly uh, clear. So next, uh, we want to think about continuous maps between say two topological spaces, call them x tau x and y tau y we say that a map or a function f between these two topological spaces is continuous if say for every open set V that's in tau y, the preimage of V denoted by f superscript minus one V uh, is open. In other words, the preimage of every open set in tau y is uh, an element of tau x which uh, is shown by this uh, little graph here, where here the uh, dashed circle denotes the open set V in Y, and uh, this dashed blue circle denotes the open set in X. And uh, this uh, 
dark blue circle is the per image of V, which is open in uh, the topology we equipped on X for uh, tau of X. And we say that F is continuous if this holds for every open set V in Y. And our goal today is to uh, equip the sets of uh, continuous maps, say between two topological spaces, X and Y, which we know there are uh, many, many of them. And we want to equip this set of continuous maps with a topology that satisfies uh, certain properties. Uh, what properties are, do we want to satisfy is uh, our next uh, question. So as I just said, we want to go from say the sets of uh, continuous maps between two topological spaces to a topological space of uh, continuous maps between two topological spaces. In other words, we want to equip the set of continuous maps from uh, topological spaces X and Y, denoted by say C of X, Y with the topology so that uh, now this uh, set of continuous maps CXY becomes a topological space uh, of continuous maps. And uh, we are interested in a certain property of such topology. But before we actually go into this property, let's consider say three topological spaces, X, Y, and Z. And first uh, let's consider say the sets of uh, continuous maps between uh, x cross z to y denoted by small g, where we are sending the uh, tuple small x, small z, where x is an element of capital X and z is an element of capital Z to an element y in capital Y. Uh, if we say fix the variable small z in capital Z, then the function g of x z now becomes a map instead of from x cross z to y, it's now becomes a map from x to y because small z is now fixed. And we denote this map by g uh, dash z, where small z is fixed. And this dash can be say any element uh, in capital X. Now with this notion, let's consider another set uh, from say Z to the set uh, of uh, continuous maps from X to Y, CXY, which sends a uh, Z to G of dash Z, which we just defined here. It's a map from X to Y. And we want to study uh, the relationships between these two sets, this blue set and this uh, red set. So now we have an updated goal. We want to establish, a, say, a one-to-one -one correspondence, in other words, a bijection between the set of uh, continuous maps from x cross z to y, denoted by c of x cross z y, and the set of uh, continuous maps between z and uh, the set of continuous maps between x and y, denoted by c of z, c of x y, and we want to uh, say, define a topology on CXY so that it has a property where when small g is uh, continuous, our assignment from z to g of dash z would define a continuous map between capital Z and uh, c of x, y. And likewise, if we have a continuous map from Z to C of X, Y, uh, de denoted by G hat, we again, we want to assemble say a family of continuous maps uh, from say X to Y, which are say parameterized by the space Z into a single continuous map from X cross Z to Y denoted by small g. And this concerns uh, with the definition of exponential topology. But before we explicitly define exponential topology, we want to define 
uh, splitting and conjoining topologies. We say that a topology on the set of continuous maps between x and y is splitting if the continuity of g between x cross z to y implies the continuity of g hat from z to c of x, y. And conversely, we say that a topology on c of x, y is conjoining if the continuity of g hat implies the continuity of g, which uh, it's also demonstrated by uh, this little graph here. And before we define exponential topology, uh, we want to talk about uh, two little lemmas that leads to the definition of exponential topology. So the first lemma says that if we have a topology on CXY that is conjoining, then the evaluation map epsilon from X cross CXY to y, which sends a uh, small x from capital X and a continuous function f uh, in cxy into the function value f evaluated at x. And this map, we say that it's continuous if a topology on cxy is conjoining. So this can be essentially proved by the definition of conjoining topology. Suppose we let capital Z to be CXY with a conjoining topology. Then now uh, epsilon hat from Z to CXY, which is just the identity map from CXY to itself. Then not only for conjoining topology, in fact, for any topology on CXY, the identity map will always be continuous. Then by the definition of conjoining topology, this implies that epsilon, which is precisely the evaluation map x cross cxy to y is continuous. And so uh, this concludes the proof for this lemma. And for lemma two, let's recall a little definition about uh, the comparison between topologies. Suppose we have say two topologies on a set tau one and tau two, such that tau one is contained in tau two. In other words, say we have a collection of open sets denoted by the uh, dashed uh, black circle here. Then tau one, it's a smaller collection of some of these uh, open sets. And tau two, it's a larger collection of these open sets. In other words, every element in tau one is also an element in tau two then we say that the topology tau one is closer than the topology tau two. Uh, alternatively, we also say that the topology tau two is finer than the topology tau one. And uh, with this notion in, uh, in mind, we gave our second lemma. We say that every splitting topology on the set of continuous functions CXY is closer than every conjoining topology on CXY. In other words, any splitting topology is contained in any conjoining topology. So the proof uh, is also very straightforward. Suppose we say we equipped CXY with a splitting topology and the conjoining topology, and we obtain topological spaces for both of them denoted by SPXY and COXY. Then B by lemma one, the evaluation map epsilon from X cross uh, COXY, which is the topological space of CXY equipped with the conjoining topology to Y is continuous. Now by the uh, definition of splitting topology, uh, because uh, epsilon is uh, continuous, then uh, the map epsilon hat from the, uh, the topological space uh, on CXY with the quadrating topology to the topological space with the splitting topology is also continuous. And recall that in the proof of uh, lemma one, we we know that the uh, epsilon hat on the set CXY 
it's just the identity map. That means that the per image for any open sets in the uh, splitting topology, it's uh, just the open set itself. In other words, it's also open in the conjoining topology. This means that uh, every open set in splitting topology, it's also open in the conjoining topology. And so the splitting topology is uh, contained in the conjoining topology. In other words, it is closer than any conjoining topology on CXY. And with these notions in mind, we can finally define the exponential topology on CXY. Suppose we have a topology on CXY that so that the corresponding correspondence from G to G hat defines a bijection between these two sets, which are the set of continuous maps uh, G from X cross Z to Y and the set of continuous maps G hat from Z to C of XY. Then we say that this topology is the exponential topology on CXY. In other words, the exponential topology is uh, both splitting and conjoining because uh, G continues implies G hat continues, so it's splitting. Also, G, G hat continues implies G continues, so it's also conjoining. So it's both conjoining and splitting. And we claim that. Uh, if there exists a exponential topology on CXY, then it's unique. Uh, this is because suppose we have two distinct exponential topology on CXY denoted by tau one, tau two, then by definition, they are both splitting and conjoining. But by lemma two, tau one splitting, tau two conjoining implies tau one is contained in tau two. Likewise, tau two splitting and tau one conjoining implies tau two is con uh, included or contained by tau one, that means that these two topology must equal to each other. And so we have a unique exponential topology on CXY if it exists. If it exists. And uh, this is the uh, end of my talk today. Sorry, it's a little bit fast at the end. Thank you, Yan Bing. That was a very interesting talk. I never thought about you know maps between mm -hmm. continuous maps. Okay, so now we have you, Yoshi, who is going to speak about an intro to a Hodgkin-Huxley model. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. I was on mute. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Ajmane. Um, I uh, so I realized as I was preparing this that I might have a little bit more material than I intended to have, um, and also there is um, you know, unlike the previous talks, there's going to be this will be more impressionistic and less definitional. So, I, but everything that I say has more um content to it than what I'm saying and I'm gonna go a little bit fast so um if you I, I know I don't think there's time for questions but if you want to if you're confused about something and you you have an inclination to want to know more or something like that you know feel free to hit me up okay so what are the Hodgkin Huxley equations so it, in a nutshell they're like um the set of equations that these guys Hodgkin and Huxley wrote down in the 1950s to model particular electrical properties of brain cells. And so, you know, like we have on the order of 100 million or 100 billion or something brain cells in um, our, our brain. And so they're called neurons and they act collectively to create our thoughts and perceptions. And it's thought that these electrical signaling properties that they have is like a key component in sort of creating all this stuff. So Hodgkin and Huxley, um, model like wrote down a model to um, model a particular type of electrical signaling feature that I'll describe to you. 
So you know, this thing on the this thing here on the left, these green things. So this is these are the neurons and like a, um, this is what neurons might look like if you're a fly. Um, but you know our thing is a little bit more complicated. But just so that there's a picture, so, so for some context, um, there's a lot of them, right? And they're attached in many different ways. And so I'm just going to consider like this scheme here where we have cell A, cell B, and cell C. And we're going to, I'm gonna sort of sketch out generally what it means to be, have electrical signaling between cells and how you model them. So, so we're imagining like cell A, cell B, and cell C. Okay, so um, the electrical signaling properties come from like the, there's like a bath of ions that live like, you know, like these, these, these neurons live in a bath of ions and there, there are specialized pores on the cell wall that allow these ions in and out. And this creates like a sort of, so th this is one's place I'm not being very specific. There's, there's sort of like a charge separation. It's not exactly that, but it sets up this thing called a potential difference uh, across the cell membrane. And at the base state, uh, when there's no electrical signaling, there is a potential difference uh, like that's set up by this charge um, imbalance that's like is conventionally around negative 60 or negative 70 millivolts. Um, and so this electrical signaling property that I'm talking about consists of like perturbations away from this electrical or uh, perturbations away from this base state in a particular way. And that particular way is like letting ions in and out of the cell in some controlled way. Okay. So here, so the, the, the general sequence, the, the generic sequence of events is the, as follows. So cell A in a way that I'm not describing will be like, hey, cell B, I want to tell you that it, um, I, uh, I'm I'm signaling you, okay. So this this is done in a particular way, and then cell B is like okay, it opens up some more ion channels than it would have normally, and that causes a charge imbalance like at at this point here, and those ions they'll like diffuse into this area here. So this is called the soma of the cell. So this thing is so these black things here. Um, so when these ions diffuse in, they cause a perturbation away from this resting membrane potential. So I I don't I already I'm I'm forgetting whether or not I've defined things and I'm using jargon. So you know, um, it's I guess everything is impressionistic. But feel free to say, ask me questions. So this is called a resting potential. Um, so when these ions, they diffuse into the cell, they'll uh, perturb um, the voltage away from the resting potential. And this is occurring, you know, what you don't see here are a bunch of other cells and they're all telling cell B, hey, uh, you know, it's time to signal. And so this process is happening at a bunch of different places. And all these, at all these places, you have ions flowing into the cell. So that's what you see here. Um, at a particular point, um, you're going to, so this is called depolarization. At a particular point, um, the cell B is like, hey, I'm, I'm pretty depolarized. I want to tell uh, the next cell that I'm depolarized. So there's a, um, so there's a, spe a special depol um, a, a special like physiological event that happens right here. So it's called the axon hillock. And at this point, like lots of ion channels open at, in, in this particular location. And like, it, th there's a massive voltage perturbation here. Um, and this voltage perturbation in a way that I'm not describing, um, there's like a bunch of physiology, um, relevant physiology that propagates this like massive perturbation unidirectionally in this way. In, in this direction towards cell C. So you like, this is distinguished from like the previous depolarizations I was talking about before, right? They were just like small, like 
ions, you know, float in here, they float in here, they float in here, and they sort of just sort of depolarize the, uh, this, the cell and uh, slowly. But this is like a massive depolarization event, and it um, it involves a, 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 like an exchange of a lot of different ions at this place. And those ions, they 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 cause. There's so many that come in that they cause depolarization events, like in neighboring regions of. So this thing is called the axon. Um, so this is the thing that Hodgkin and Huxley. Uh, modeled. They wrote down some equations to model this process. So um, so to do that, they wrote down this this equation. So they modeled the cell as like using like a circuit. Um, they imagined the, the, the cell as like some circuit and then they wrote down some ODE. Um, uh, they wrote down some ordinary differential equation that sort of described the voltage perturbation of the cell. Um, and so uh, let me uh, like, I'm not going to describe all of these terms, but maybe I'll just give you a sense of what's going on. So it, it feels less formal. Uh, sorry, I'm going to burp. Okay. So like the idea is, so in the, um, the easiest thing, so this, this, this guy has like a bunch of terms. So I'm going to start with, uh, a simplified version of that simplified model. So we're going to imagine we have like some DVDT equals um, negative GL. So I'm going to explain what all this stuff is in a minute. So I, I, there's this diagram that I've repeatedly been showing you. Um, so, so this is EL. So this is at like negative 70, right? And so if you solve this uh, ODE, or, or if, you, if you know what that is, but uh, basically it's an equation that's, that you solve for the voltage as a function of time, um, you'll get that the voltage as a function of time can be written as EL plus V naught minus EL e to negative t over, uh, oops. Uh, what is it, c over gl. OK, so um, basically, Yoshi? Yeah, what's up? Is little g a function here, or is it a constant? It's a constant. This is a constant. It's not dependent on voltage. And that's important. So thank you for telling me that or asking this question. Um, this is a constant. This is also a constant. The only things that are a variable or as a function, or the only things that are a function of time are this, is this guy. Um, okay. Oh, there's a C here that is not here. So this is a C and this is also a constant. So um, maybe I should be consistent and say that. Okay. So, um, so what 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 is this guy saying? This so I'm gonna say v naught is like an initial condition. So if I start at an initial condition and I let my solution evolve, basically this this thing that I just wrote here, right? It's gonna decay like this, and the 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 pace at which this decays is something like on the order of c over g l. So this is like some constant, and so, um, right. So, so, so the point is that this term in the Hodgkin-Huxley equation, no matter where I am, like if I start here, it's always going to want to push my voltage to this equilibrium state, EL. Like no matter where I am, I always like this. This thing is the resting potential, and I always want to come back to rest no matter where I go. Okay. So you imagine that this is the case. Now, what I just told you was what this, the behavior of this term. What Hodgkin and Huxley did was just like, all right, so I have this. So what I sort of described is like, if you're here, like if you only have this term, then you get pushed down to this equilibrium state. But what, what about all this shenanigans over here? So what's gonna happen is that Hodgkin and Huxley introduced some other terms. They, um, 
introduce so this vm is the oh man i should have used consistent terminology this vm is the membrane voltage so i was calling this v before so basically what happens is um these things so 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 generically what's get, what what is the the way to read this or one way to read this is that uh, each one of these terms like has this EL and this GL or this E term and this G term associated to it. E is like um, where, like what the steady state is and G is like how fast you approach it. Okay, so if I add more terms, then I have a bunch of competing equilibria, these guys, and I have a, a bunch of rates at which I'm trying to push this equilibria to. So what Hodgkin and Huxley uh, did, so I mean, they didn't do, like they looked at the physiology, like I'm explaining it in like a sort of a mathy way, but they, you know, they were physicists, they were like biologists and then they, they did this backwards. But, you know, if you're a modeler, you can just be like, oh, okay, I can make these guys voltage dependent. So if, um, it, if in some way, I'm able to perturb away from my resting membrane potential um, sufficiently, then, or, you know, if I make this G, so G N A is going to equal, oh no, equal zero for uh, V less than negative 65 and G N A equals, you know, 10 if V is greater than or equal to negative 65. So the, the, this term doesn't exist, but then it suddenly pushes away as soon as you like perturb this enough. Um, so I'm not being very specific about this, but this is the sense in which like ba basically these things are voltage dependent. And when you reach a certain threshold, suddenly you get all this weird pushing to these other values and they arranged their model in a particular way that it creates this spike. And um, the, the voltage dependence of the, so this is the actual set of equations, the voltage dependence of this, this term, these terms, so you can see like, so this is G and A and G and A is equal to M and H. And then M and H have two other things. They have this alpha and this beta, and you can see that those are dependent on voltage. So the voltage dependence comes in through this other set of equations. Um, and all of this has like physiological, like biophysical, um, there's like a reason for this three, and then there's a reason for writing this in this way, but, oh, am now, I over? Yep. Okay. Um, so, yeah, all right. Thank you, Yoshi. Yeah. Now we have all right. Mosh, who will be speaking on computable structures, which are isomorphic, but not computably isomorphic. Hi. Um, so unfortunately, my, unfortunately, like my Wi-Fi went down like a couple of minutes ago. So I'm using my phone data now. Hopefully that'll hold over. We'll see. Where's my, there we go. All right. So I'm using this because I want to be able to write. So I'm using this. Okay, so we're talking about non-computable isomorphisms between computable structures. So let's first start with our, like we're only going to talk about linear orders in this talk. So a linear order is an order um, which um, with the property that either that either A less than B or B less than A or B equals A, right? Those are exclusive options. And also we have transitivity, which means that if A less than B and B less than C, then we have A less than C. And we say they're isomorphic. Two linear orders are isomorphic if there is a bijection, which reserves the order, right? So it's a simple definition. Um, and all right, so we're going to talk about omega and omega squared. So suppose we're giving a linear ordering on, on the natural numbers. And so this is some other order, not the regular one. And it's computed by some program. So what does that mean? That means that there is some, there's a program which when you input two numbers into it, it tells you like eventually it halts and it tells you which number is smaller, right? Assuming, assuming that they're not the same number. If they're the same number, let's say it just 
it just tells you they're the same number, right? So there's three options. Okay. And we're told that this linear order is isomorphic to omega. And what that means is that um, there, there is an element which, which is the initial element. And it's so that there's a, what is the smallest element. And then every other element is a finite successor. It's, um, so successor just means that, um, so we say that A is a successor, is the successor of B. If um, B is less than A and um, there is no element, there does not exist C with um, B less than C less than A, right? So that's what, that's what a successor is. That's what the successor is. And when I say a finite successor, I mean that you apply this, this thing, this function, some number of times, eventually you get to any other number. Okay. So that's what a successor is. Um, so, all right, so, so a natural question to ask is, is there a computable isomorphism? Um, so if, if we have an isomorphism, right? So we know that we know what exists, can we find it using a program, right? So it, so do, so it does a computable isomorphism exist, right? So yeah, so in other words, is there any program which on input n, in this case, outputs the nth smallest element of order? That's what an isomorphism to the, to the standard copy omega means. It just means that we take a number in, we output the nth smallest element of our order. Okay, so I guess like, so it depends. So I'm not, I'm not sure if this is, this is like obviously true or obviously false to people. I think it depends on like your experience with orders, if it's obviously true or obviously false. But the, the answer is no. And to answer this question, we kind of have to talk about the halting problem. And so the halting problem, we have a listing of all our programs. So we call the nth program phi, um, phi sub e. And the halting program is the halting problem which is written zero jump, the, the apostrophe is called this jump, is the set of all pairs nm where the nth um, Turing program halts on input m. Okay. And okay, so there's some facts about it. So it's not computable, right? This is a famous fact. It's famously not computable. There is no program that when you give it input um, n comma m, it decides if the nth program halts on input m. That, that can't happen. And the second fact is it is enumerable. There, there is a way of, of enumerating it, which means that there is a program which it basically makes a list, right? So on input n, it gives you, a, like, but I'm like, as you give it inputs, it gives you a larger and larger list. And eventually every element of the halting problem is in, is in a list, right? But every, but, and the list is entirely made up of elements of the halting problem. But um, the problem is that at every stage, it only gives you a finite list. Right, so you're able to list all of the elements of the halting problem out, but you can't, but you don't know at any given point whether an element is in or isn't in the halting problem. Okay, so Oracle machines. So we're going to need this to to kind of just to discuss this more. So an A Oracle machine. So if you, if if A is a set, the Oracle machine is a program that has. It, I'm, I'm like it has the additional functionality of asking A questions. So in particular for the halting problem, the questions that you can ask are of the form, does a given program halt, right? And then, and then if, if it does, the Oracle gives you a yes answer. If it doesn't, the Oracle gives you a no answer. Like Oracle is kind of fitting here because it literally means, oh, but like, like here's some like supernatural being which can answer, you know, these unanswerable questions, right? That's like, you should, like it really is very, you know, like I'm like the same vibes as Oracle, as Oracles in, um, you know, um, mythology and such. And okay, so uh, what we first want to do is we want to show that there actually there is a zero jump oracle machine. Um, so it, it, there's, there's a halting oracle machine which can compute the isomorphism between any copy of omega and omega. And basically, this is going to reduce to being okay. So what what is what is it? So we just got we, so, so what I said before is that if you're isomorphic to omega, that means you have some initial element. Let's call a sub zero. And then, and then there, there's some ordering, right? That there's some element a sub one. There's an element a sub one, which is the immediate successor of a, of a sub zero. There's an element a sub two, which is the immediate successor of a sub one and so on. And every element is the, is, is the eventual successor of a sub zero. So basically, if we want to find the isomorphism, we want to output a sub n on input n, then we just need to find the successor function. And then, we, and then once we do that, 
we, we feed a sub zero into it and we just iterate and eventually we get, we get what f of n is. Um, yeah. Okay, so then, so, so, so here's the idea. We want to compute the successor function using the zero jump. And so the idea is that given a number n, we look for the successor of n in our, in our order as follows. So we go through every number one by one. And so, so basically in order, for, in order for it to be possible that a number m is, is, is the successor, then actually, then it has to be greater than n. That's one of the requirements. And the second requirement is that there is no numbers between n and m, right? So, okay. So first we, so when we see a, a possible candidate for being, for being the successor of n, then we're like, okay, how, how do we know it's not the successor of n? Or how do we know it is? So we, we look for an element in between n and, n and m. And so the thing is that, so we search through all the numbers for an element in between n and m. And the thing is that's a program, right? So searching through all the numbers for an element in between, that's a program. So therefore we can ask zero jump if it halts. And the holding problem is gonna give us an answer. And depending on the answer, we, we proceed differently. So if it answers no, Right, so if the halting problem ans answers no to our question, then we know that m is a successor. There is no element in between n and m, so m is the, m is the successor of n. So we're done. We, we found the successor. And then if it answers yes, then that, then that means that we're not done, that there is some stuff in between, so we just gotta keep looking. And, 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 the, and the thing is because our order looks like omega, that means eventually we're going to find some successor. Right, that, that means a, a successor exists. So, that this, so this program, so if we just keep searching, we'll find it eventually. Okay, this is how we, this is how we, we can compute the successor function using zero jump. Okay, so now we've shown that we have access to a holding oracle. Then we can actually compute the isomorphism between our copy and omega, All right? So then the question is like, okay, is there may, maybe we're wrong about meaning a zero jump? Maybe there's some really cool algorithm which can actually figure this out without using zero jump at all, right? Maybe that exists. And so yeah, so the question is, can we show that's not true? Can, can we can we build a computable linear order, which is isomorphic to omega, but that we can't, um, but that being able to compute the isomorphism actually would allow us to compute the Halting problem. Okay, so the idea is that the idea is that we want to kind of like encode the Halting problem into omega, um, it, um, into that linear order, in some way, so that if we can if we can figure out this linear order, we can actually figure out the Halting problem, and we actually can do that. We we can do this. So the, the idea is that we use the fact that the holding problem is computably enumerable, which means that we can list it out, right? So, so, so there's a way of listing it out. Eventually every element will be in our list. So here's the idea. We fix a coding function between um, omega squared and omega, which gives us a bijection. And um, the, the, the idea is that we, we start, that we build a linear order. We start off with all the even numbers. Right, so, so we have all the even numbers with a standard order. And then we and then we take all the rest of the numbers and we kind of deal them out in between the even numbers. And the deal is that if the pair n comma m, if that's gonna be the halting problem and, and it's enumerated at some stage, then at that stage, we put an element in between two times, at, like, like in between that even number, those two even numbers, which correspond to n m, right? So two, two times the coding number for n m, and two times the coding number for n m plus one. So you put, um, you, you, so you put an element in between those two. And so um, figuring out if there is an element in between those two guys, which we can definitely do using an isomorphism, right? Like if we have an isomorphism between our copy, between this copy we just built and the standard copy, then given these two elements, to um, um, given these two elements, we can we can check if there's a guy in between them, right? So if it, so, so just checking that that would tell that would solve the halting problem. Okay, so fi so figuring out if if um two times if two times the code number n m is um is 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 the um the, if, if, if if its successor is is two times the code number of n m plus one that solves the halting problem, right? So therefore, if we have access to the isomorphism, we can solve the halting problem. Theref therefore, it actually is exactly at, so. Therefore, we actually do need the halting problem in our solution. Okay. All right. So now we now we move on to discuss omega squared, right? So I'm going to draw omega squared a little bit. So so this is the linear order of, of, of all ordered pairs and m. So this looks like a bunch of columns. 
each column looks like a copy of omega, right? So, so each column looks like a copy of omega, and and there's omega number of number of columns. These columns are arranged in an omega order. Okay. And okay, so so the element n. So yeah, the way order works is n one m one is smaller than n two m two if n two m two if n one is smaller than than two, or if they're equal, then if m one is smaller than m two. Yeah. Okay. So and the other thing of this, it just says omega many copies of omega, right? Like that's kind of what I described a second ago. All right. So the same problem for omega squared is so if we have a program which computes an order on omega, which is isomorphic to omega squared. So it makes it kind of makes sense that the isomorphism should be at least as hard as the one for omega, right? Like, like if we could if, if we needed a the whole thing problem in order to figure out the general isomorphism for omega, then it makes sense we would need it to figure out the general isomorphism for omega squared at least, right? And then it's just like, okay, do we need more? Do we need more information than the halting problem? Turns out, yeah, we need a lot more information. Okay, so, so we actually need, so actually solving the isomorphism problem for omega squared is harder than the halting problem. So let's kind of talk about that. So we need to kind of discuss some more Oracle machines in order to do this. So, 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 there, so, so as I said before, there is a list of all Turing machines, but, but, but you also have Oracle machines and there is a list of all Oracle machines as well. So phi a, so this guy over here, phi a to the, um, phi to the a sub n, that means the nth a Oracle machine. And yeah, so then we could do this, the exact same thing as the halting problem. We could do the exact same procedure. So zero to define some more higher order halting problems. So, okay, so we can define zero jump jump. This is going to be, this is going to be the, the set of nm where the nth zero jump Turing machine halts an input m. So this is the halting problem if you assume all your Turing machines are actually um, halting problem Oracle machines. And then you can do the same thing for, if you, if you have instead of halting problem Oracle machines, you have zero jump jump Oracle machines, you could define zero triple jump. It turns out that actually, okay, well, I'll discuss in a second. Okay, so we, have, so, we have, so we have an inequality, a strict inequality. And this means that, uh, so zero triple jump is strictly harder than zero jump, which means that we can, we can compute zero jump with a zero double jump Oracle, but not vice versa. And then zero triple jump is strictly harder than zero double jump, which means that we can compute zero triple, um, zero double jump with a triple jump Oracle, but not vice versa. And then another fact that we have is that, so zero double jump is kind of cumbersome to work with, but there's a nicer set that, that's equivalent that contains the exact same amount of information. And this set is called fit. So we're going to use this set. I'll, I'll talk more about it later. Okay. All right. So let's talk more about this problem. So it turns out that actually, given a, given a copy, we can we can find the isomorphism, but we need zero triple jump, right? So there, there's a way of doing it with a zero triple jump Oracle. But now, but now the thing is like, okay, maybe that's not optimal. Maybe there's a better way of doing it. So then, so it, but it turns out we actually could also encode zero triple jump into a linear order and get the same sort of converse we had for the previous case. Right, which which is that we actually do need a zero triple jump oracle in order to decode any like an isomorphism. We actually do need that, but yeah, that's beyond the scope of the talk. But yeah, so so but however, it's easier to show for double jump, right? It's easier to show that you can encode fin into our order. Okay, so we're going to do this kind of similarly for to the, what we did for omega. So what what we're going to do is that imagine we have. So, so, we're, so, we're, so imagine you have an infinite sequence of columns. So you have a bunch of columns and all the odd columns, all the even columns are going to be copies of omega, let me like this. So all the even ones start off as copies of omega, all the odd ones start off as having one element. Okay. And then we want, we want to have kind of assign each column, each, um, each W sub n, each fin, sorry, each W sub n, which is the X such that the nth Turing machine halts on, um, on input x. We want to assign each of those to an odd column. So we assign it to the 2n plus first column. And that column is going to talk about w sub n. OK. So and the, and the idea here is that all, all, we, all we're going to do is we're going to put, so we're going to enumerate all the elements in w sub n. We're, we're going to list them out. And then whenever a new one gets listed out, um, so and whenever a new one gets listed out, we're just going to put another element in the 2n plus first column. So whenever, like, so, so we're able to do this. We're able to list out all these elements. And whenever, all the, whenever any of these elements get listed out, 
we put another element into, into the 2n plus first column. And then the idea here is that if, so there's two options. If the, um, so, so if the 2n plus first column is finite, so that's gonna be finite if and only if um, w sub n is finite. So that, that means this column detects n belonging to fin, which is good, that's what we wanted. So that's, okay, so that's good. And then, um, so, um, so, but more, more specifically, we, we can use the first element of the two of the two n plus second column. So we can use the first element of this guy in order to detect the stuff. So we can, we can set, so because if, if the two n plus first column is finite, it's going to stack with the two n plus second column. And it's going to turn into one copy of omega, right? So over here, we have a bunch of copies of omega, but if we have a finite stack, it's going to stack with this guy and it's going to turn into one copy. Okay. Um, so, but if it's infinite, it's going, you're just going to get a separate copy of omega, right? So, so, so if you're, um, so if you have an infinite list, you're going to be a, a, second, a separate copy. So because of this, um, what we do is that um, we use, we're going to use the isomorphism between our order and the standard copy in order to figure out if a sub n um, is the first is the first element of a copy. So if the so 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 if like um, if, if if n is in fin, then we're going to get a stack, and then that means that a sub n is not going to be the first element of a column anymore. It's not going to be the first element of a copy of omega anymore. Okay, so. If, um, yeah, so base summation note is that because of our, the way we do it, their construction, the, um, if, if a sub n is the first element of a copy of omega, it must be the first element of one of the first two n plus two copies, right? Just, just because it's, just because that's how we did it, right? Because there's, it's the first guy of the two n plus first, of the two n plus second column, and then all the other columns either get filled out or just stack onto other columns. So you have less than two n plus two columns before it. Okay, so that means we only so we only need to check if it's in the first two n plus two guys, and that's fine. And then, so another thing to notice is that in the standard copy of omega squared, um, that's that's a set n comma n with this property. Um, so then, all all the first elements are of the form k comma zero. So all we gotta do is just take those elements, right, and then look at the first two n plus two of them, and look where they get mapped to. And if anything, if anything get mapped to a sub n, we're done. And if a and don't come after a sub n, we're done. And that and that's how we figure out if a sub n is the is the first element of a column, right? By by looking at where the, the first elements of the columns in omega squared get mapped to. Okay. So there, so there, therefore using this, that lets us, so once you figure that out, which we can do if we know the isomorphism, that lets us figure out fin. And fin is fin is equivalent to zero jump jump, which is strictly harder than the Halton problem. So yeah, the punchline here is that there's going to be a, a copy of omega squared with a property that the isomorphism can compute fin, which, which, is, which is harder than the Halton problem. And then the more general problem, which I'm considering is, um, so, so it's really not hard to show that you could, you, that you can, that any isomorphism between omega to the n and a copy can be computed from the two n plus first jump of zero. But then the, then the converse is what I'm, inter what I'm interested in, which is um, like, is so can you actually encode the two n plus first jump of, of, of zero into omega to the n, it, it, like in the way that we talked, that I talked about before, or is this not true, right? So, and like, where does this, if this is not true, where does it break down? If it's true, why, right? So that's, that's the question, that's the more general question that I'm interested in. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really sorry if this is rushed, but like, I didn't realize, yeah, I didn't realize how hard the time constraint would be, but that's that's the talk. Um, Thank you. That was great. Are there any questions? Now we have to move on to Tim Allen's talk oh, on okay. quasi-symmetry groups or quadratic Julia sets. Uh, okay, I'll share my screen. Um, I'm going to fight this, you know. Uh, time challenge and see if you know how much I can go through in 10 minutes as clear as I can. We're probably not going to talk about what quasi symmetric maps are, unfortunately. Um, but that's okay, we can still talk about the majority of uh, what's going on here. Uh, so the first thing we'll start with is talking about Thompson groups and what those are. And this will be central throughout the talk, all 10 minutes of it. And there's three Thompson groups, 
um, which are typically denoted by F, T, and V. Um, so F, and, and without jumping in straight into the definition, they're, they're best understood in terms of how they act on certain spaces. So F uh, acts on the interval, um, T acts on the unit circle, or just the circle, uh, and V acts on a cantor set. And here I've drawn an element from each of them, and it's actually the same element from each of them because F, T, and V can naturally sit inside each other. They're nested groups. Um, and so this element, um, which I've called A, takes the first fourth of the interval and it stretches it by a factor of two. So now it sits, goes, spans from zero to one half. Um, it takes the interval from one half, one fourth to one half and it just shifts it. And then it takes the interval from one half to one and it compresses it by a half. And we see something similar for the circle um, using the angle as, as sort of our measurement of length and something similar on the cantor set. But let's, let's look at a, a, a definition of T. F is also similarly defined in this way. So the Thompson group T is the group of piecewise linear orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle whose slopes are integer powers of two, so it can stretch or contract by uh, power of two, and whose breakpoints are dyadic rationals. Um, in other words, they're of the form k over two to the n, where k and n are both natural numbers. And so, um, and you see an example above. So T is generated by three elements, which we'll refer to as A, B, and C. Um, F, T, and V are all finitely presented, but they are infinite groups. Um, so just to say that they have finitely many generators um, that can be written with finitely many relations. And this completely describes the group. Um, so one remark about these, uh, sorry, I need to moving things around on my screen. So one remark is that a key thing about these groups and how they're able to act on the spaces that they, they do is they rely on the fact that the spaces are self-similar. You know, if you zoom in at one part of the interval, that's not the endpoint, and you zoom in on another point of the interval that's not the endpoint, they look exactly the same. It's just flat. Um, same with the circle and same with cantor sets. Um, and another thing is that upon taking closures, these form uh, the full automorphism groups of these spaces. Um, in the cases of the line segment and the circle, we, these are orientation preserving automorphism groups. So we don't, we always go counterclockwise on the circle. We're not, we don't do a reflection down. We don't include that. So one question is, do these groups generalize to other settings? Um, are there other self-similar spaces that have automorphism groups, which are the closure of groups similar to Thompson groups. And this leads us to Julia sets. Um, so Julia sets are these sort of self-similar, there's fractal objects, um, and there's gonna be a, a wealth of examples here. Um, but let's define what these are, because I'm sure not everyone knows. And I'm just gonna define them for a polynomial, which is a little bit easier to do to give the definition. So if P uh, is a polynomial on the complex plane, then the filled Julia set is the set of non-escaping points. So it's the, the set of points in the plane such that when I take iterates, um, when I iterate my polynomial starting at this point and it sort of bounces around, the sequence of points, its orbit stays bounded. It doesn't go off to infinity. You know, with any polynomial, if you go far enough away from the origin, uh, and you iterate it, it's going to go off to infinity because of the nature of polynomials. Um, but there will be potentially, there will be some set, there will always be some set that stays bounded. This is called the filled Julia set. And then the Julia set for a polynomial is the boundary of the filled Julia set. Um, and it's, uh, if my polynomial is P, then this is referred to as J of P, or just J if it's understood. 
And the Mandel broad set, I mean, we're talking about polynomials, but from now on, we're really just going to look at quadratics. And there's there's like so much that that can be said about just quadratics. It's it's kind of incredible. Um, and we can we can regard essentially any quadratic in the form f c of z equals z squared plus c. And you might think, well, there's a lot more quadratics than that. You know, I could have a z squared plus b z plus c. But if we conjugate by some affine map, um, then we get it in this form. And, and this is really all, all the forms up to some equivalence. So we can, we can represent any quadratic in the form z squared plus c. And then the Mandelbrot set is the set of parameter values c for which the Julia set is connected. Okay, and one one fact is that in the in this quadratic case, um, the Julia set is either connected or it's a Cantor set. So now let's look at pictures because pictures are fun. Um, so here in the middle we have the Mandelbrot set, and ooh, I lost my arrow between the origin. But for c equals zero, and that's sort of around here, if you can see my cursor, um, uh, we just get z goes to z squared. And the corresponding Phil Julia set is the unit disk. And the Julia set then is the unit circle. Well, that's exactly the set that the Thompson, the circle Thompson group T acts on. And there's a couple more special ones. If I take C equals minus two, this one that's at the very left, we get, this is called a Chebyshev polynomial. And in this case, the Julia set and also the filled Julia set is an interval. And so that corresponds to F, um, the interval Thompson group. And then if I pick a parameter outside of the Mandelbrot set, then the Julia set is a Cantor set. And now we're being acted on by the Thompson group V. But then we can we can ask, I mean, you know, here we have other other interesting ones. So this one's called the, the basilica, um, which sort of looks like a, a view of a basilica with its reflection on the water. We have the airplane. We have this this case, which it's not an official name, but I'm just going to refer to it as a p equals four case. Um, in this case, the critical value at zero is periodic of period four. Airplane is period three map. Basilica is period two. And this is also uh, called the rabbit. So these are just some of the, some of the filled Julia sets um, that correspond to the parameter they correspond to is depicted uh, in the Mandelbrot set by these red line segments. So, okay, <laughs> this is like one minute left. Oh my gosh. Um, so we want to know, are there Thompson-like automorphism groups for other quadratic Julia sets? And the answer is yes. Um, and so a theorem by Belkin Forrest and my advisor, Misha Lyubich um, and Rankov independently, these two groups uh, proved that there's a Thompson-like group for the basilica, TB, which is generated by four elements, iota, A, B, and C. And here A, B, and C are Isom they form a group isomorphic to the circle Thompson group. Um, and here's iota. And I've drawn this, it's uh, not, I've drawn it in a particular way. It's sort of a rotation about this point here between these two interval, these two parts of the, the Phil Julia set, um, which is a fixed point. And it's sort of like, it's a rotation about that point. So you rotate uh, two and it gets shrunk down a little bit. And then if you rotate one and it, it gets stretched. So this is iota. If you iterate it twice, you get the identity. And then here is A, B, and C, if we just, or just A and B. Um, and A, B, and C, they act on the central component, sending different limbs to different limbs in the same way that the circle Thompson group acts on the circle. And then one last thing, I'll just end with some a theorem and another theorem in some remarks is that the 
Thompson like group for the airplane um, can be is generated by five elements um, uh, iota, C, A, B, and C, where again, iota squared is the identity, C has infinite order, and A, B, and C is isomorphic to the circle Thompson group. Um, there's the, the, the basilica, um, the Thompson like group for the basilica actually. Uh, has the method for this extends to other components that are sort of one step away from the Mandelbrot set, like the rabbit here and other these other circles, components that touch the main cardioid. And the result for the airplane, um, the method actually extends to also a larger class, which includes this P equals four case. And then what Misha and uh, Sergei prove is actually something stronger and it's in the language of quasi-symmetric maps, uh, which gives, uh, a, they, they're able to show that they can approximate things with a greater degree of regularity than just being a continuous um, map, being a homeomorphism, which would be continuous in both directions. But. Okay, and I'll stop there because I know I'm, I'm two minutes over. Um, so thank you for your time. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable for you as it was for me. And if if the um, organizers or people running this allow it, then you know I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. We can have questions. Uh, I had a um, quick question. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. You uh, you should go ahead. Oh, okay. I mean, I I was just uh, in your pictures. You had. I was just wondering if. The, these Thompson like groups were acting on the interior or the boundary because it looks like the interior so is shaded. They, they can act on both. I mean, so. Um, okay, you're smiling. It sounds like it's complicated. So, so it's, it's, okay. it's not too complicated. <laughs> I mean, okay. um, you can define the map on the boundary and, and just think of the boundary, but you can also extend these same maps into the interior. Okay, and it's like unique in some way or something. Yeah, so because these are Julia sets, which are defined in terms of a quadratic, um, these actually like the way that these maps are defined are, you know, when we were looking at maps on the circle or on the interval, we could call these piecewise linear. You know, if I restrict to certain intervals, it maps as a linear function. Well, there's a term here that I can use called piecewise dynamical, which was, I think it was invented by Misha and Sergey, where if I restrict to certain parts of the Julia set, this acts by, you know, moving, uh, applying the function forward a certain number of times, and then applying a certain branch of the inverse backwards a certain number of times. And so in this way, you can you can extend into the interior extending i suppose there's some trickiness around the critical point because this that would need to be well defined but but there are ways to extend to the interior okay all right cool thanks i have like a few questions like so with your diagram is that like trying to show that like there's like a, some kind of cycle um I'm, I'm just trying to color to show you like, you know, which, where things go. So here, this, this green part that's labeled with a two um, maps onto this larger green part that's labeled with a two. And you can see that like the inside, you know, the boundary of this central component is a Jordan curve, which is like a fancy name for being, you know, similar to a circle. Um, and because it's sort of like a circle, I mean, there's also um, a way to define, uh, to sort of parameterize it by the circle. Um, so that's why I have this sort of zero, one fourth, one half, three fourths. And what's going on here is that this map, which I've called A, I mean, I could slide up and show you, we have these sort of three regions of the boundary where it's being acted on the green, red, and orange. And what happens is that the green gets doubled, the red gets translated, 
and the orange gets shrunk by a half. This is exactly oh, the I see, same. I see. It's a, it's a this Thompson is exactly the same as the map A on the circle Thompson group. Um, so so it, it's not it's not it doesn't form a cycle. I mean, you can iterate this a lot of times, and it's not going to it's not going to be periodic or anything. Um, but but there is this notion of uh, I mean the a natural action of the circle Thompson group on the limbs is what you might call of this central component. Okay, so my other question is probably the better question. Why have they tried to do it with the Mandelbrot thing? And if they haven't like really like said, why is there like a reason why that mm, happened? Okay, it's a good question. So the Mandelbrot said, you know, <laughs> that that is a good question. I haven't thought about this. Um, I think it's harder for one. I mean, it's a very different set than the Julia sets in some sense. Um, and I don't think there would be an, an obvious answer as to why. I mean, the, hmm, that is interesting though. Um, there is, there's some notion of maps within the Mandelbrot set, you know, onto maps from subsets of the Mandelbrot set onto the whole thing, but automorph, you know, automorphisms of the Mandelbrot set. Yeah, I don't know. Um, for one, one, one thing that I think would make this less a natural question is that I know in this picture with, you know, they, they look maybe somewhat similar. The Julia sets um, are, are really, they're just the boundary of these dark components. And the Mandelbrot set is also, you know, it's interior, it's not just the boundary. It's, it's a good question. I don't have a good answer for you, but but um, no, I don't think it's been thought of. <laughs> okay, thank you. So thank you again to all of the speakers, Kurt, Yanbing, Yoshi, Mo, Yoshi, Mo, and Tim. These are really great, wonderful talks. And um, yeah, so that's Quest. Okay, thank you for organizing. <laughs>